Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love you, and we will come to you and make our dwelling with you. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am with you, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You heard me tell you I'm going away and I will come back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This reading that we heard from the Gospel occurred in the scripture of John at the Last Supper. There's a long tradition of the narration of Jesus in this final discourse that is several pages in John's Gospel. But the summation of it comes today as we read his request that his disciples, you figure there's now 11, Judas left, he's going off to betray Jesus, and the others are here, whom he trusts, Judas was a little sketchy, so he's gone anyway, and Jesus is speaking to them as someone who trusts each one of them in a special way in an intimate way. These are not his buddies. He's saying, I love you. And if you love me back, you would do what I have asked you to do. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, we've heard Jesus showing love to strangers. He cured the lepers. He gave sight to the blind. He multiplied bread. And all of those were actions of love. But today, the, the level of love is a little different, a little more intimate. He's talking to his 12, 11 now, friends who traveled with him through his ministry. He's talking to them intimately, and he knows two things. He shares some of it. He's one with the Father as he's doing this, and he knows this will be his last supper with them. They don't know that necessarily. They'll find out, as you know. And what does he say? I want you to love as I love you. Not as mothers and fathers love each other. Not as mothers and fathers love their children. Not as all of you should love each other out in the world. Not, well, we'll, we'll, we'll be specific with the, the categories of love. Agape is is like a, a love for the community, okay? Uh, philos is buddies, friends who love each other. Eros is marital love, sexual love. He, and he's saying, I'm not giving you those loves. They're already built into the relationships. I'm giving you the love that I have with the Father and the Father has with me. And that love is one. He's given us divine love. And he's asking us to take it on, to love each other divinely. Let's go a little deeper as to what that means. You know the various categories of love, what they mean, friendship and, and community love and, and erotic love, marital love. Deeper. Deeper, because this is the person who knows that the next day he'll be tried and crucified. This is the person 
who came from the Father and will return to the Father, this is the person who will conquer the biggest fear people have, death. He will conquer death. He will come back from the dead. So he has a connection, and we're very happy that he has this connection with God the Father because his word stands on God. And he's asking us that we should love one another as he loves the Father and the Father loves him. He's asking us to be divine with our love for each other. I mean, think of the people you love in your life, your children, your family, your spouse, the, the close friends. Think of them, as wonderful as it is to be with them. This is even deeper than that. And he's passing it on to us. How do we get that? How, how can we share that kind of love? Think of the person you love the best in the whole world, whoever it is, man, woman, child, doesn't matter. Jesus is saying, deeper, go deeper. My love for you is deeper than that. He shows the depth of his love. He tells the stories about himself being a shepherd who would lay down his life for his sheep. Well, this love brought him to the cross. He will lay down his life so that you and I could enter eternal life with his resurrection. So the resurrection is just not a, a, another thing to do. No, the resurrection was his way of bringing us through invitation to the Father eternally. Now, we don't know eternally. We don't know what that means. I mean, you, you could ask a scientist. You could ask a, a poet. Everybody has their own reaction to eternity. All we know is Jesus is forever. And again, we can't even imagine that. Sometimes you, you see these Nova shows on TV about space and stars and the billions of stars out there. And I'm always amazed at, at the, the age of our universe and that they can calculate it and they go even further and further and further and, and, and ex explorers always want to get to the next level. Well, Jesus been there, done that. He knows the next level. It's eternally. And we, you can't catch that on a camera, and you can't catch that in a telescope. So he's telling us that I want you to love each other where you are. So that could be family, friends, the neighbor in the street. More, and in a different and more intimate way than you can possibly imagine. What did he do? As we said, lay down his life. We don't physically have to lay down our lives to show love, but I think we have to take our lives seriously to show love. And what comes with that? Respect, self-respect, respect of the other person. What comes with that? Taking care of ourselves and taking care of the other person. When I was helping Salvatore with his junior theology lessons, Salvatore is my grandnephew. The lesson was on love. So I said, well, what's the topic about? And what, what do you want to talk about? And what do you want to write about? And, he, and I said, well, why don't you tell me what you understand as the word love? Oh, he says, oh, that, uh, that's easy. The, the teacher already told us that. It's wanting what's better or good for the other person. This is like a junior in high school teaching me what love is. And I've never forgotten that. That was two years ago. Because it is wanting better for the other person. Now, can I love myself and yet want better for the other person? That's the challenge. Jesus gave us that challenge. He wanted to love himself because he and the Father are one. So as he's loving himself, he's loving the Father. Now, now think through that. As he's loving himself, taking care of himself, he's taking care of the relationship between him and God the Father. Again, a little bit beyond our comprehension, but our faith brings us into the right category of trying to understand that. So as we're loving ourselves and being one with him, because that's his promise, he's asking us to love each other in a way that goes beyond what you can imagine. Always want what is good for the other person. 
always want what is best for the other person. Now, we're all people, aren't we? And sometimes the people we love are pains in the neck, right? Sometimes they tempt us. Sometimes they yell at us. Sometimes we yell at them. Sometimes we're jealous of them. These are the people we love. Forget the ones we don't love. And yet, he's asking us to go inside and still want what's best. And when we're doing that, we're praying because we're taking his word seriously. And when we're praying, loving one another, which means flexibility, forgiveness, understanding, caring, and the list goes on. We can most clearly see it in the family life as we see a mother and her children, a mother and her baby. We, We understand what that is as she cares for her child. But it's deeper than that. To really love someone, again, in some relationships, they go to marriage. So you got through the the romantic stages of the relationship. Some relationships are childbearing. So you love the kid as he grows up. And some are peers, your brother, your sister, your neighbor. Deeper than that, Jesus is saying. And it should leave us questioning. How can we be deeper than that? We pray. We ask for God's energy and, 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 and light. G- give me a portion, an instantaneous portion of what you and the Father have as a relationship. So I may love this person who I see in a way you love your Father whom you do not see. It's pretty poetic, you might say. But in these Sundays after Easter, as we're reflecting on our history as a church, we reflect on good news, bad news. We reflect on the persecution of the early church in the Acts of the Apostles. We we reflect on uh, the chaos that the church experienced. And uh, you heard the reading. Some groups of early Christians were teaching something to this group, and Paul and Barnabas got upset. And they sent a letter down to Antioch, which is the first place in the world that Christians were called Christians. So we're talking about a little political upheaval, a a little aggravation, a little power play. This is the church. This is the church, normal and living. And if they have a problem, we'll have a problem too. With that, no. We don't care if people are circumcised, uncircumcised. That's, that's the, the old law and the new law. But we do care about people's actions. That's never sta- st- stayed aside. That's always been forefront. To respect and love each other. To respect and love and open our doors to every person. That's rooted in the Acts of the Apostles, and that's what this whole reading is about. Open the doors. No one's restricted. No one can stay out. No one's n- not allowed in. That's our church. And yes, the Holy Spirit was with the church to inspire them to write that letter, as as the author says, but the Holy Church is still with us today, each one of us, to inspire us to do the right thing, to practice life and respect life on all levels, to be people who prefer and work for peace and not war, To be people, again, it's in the scriptures, it's our history. To be people who reject prejudice and hate and tolerate one another in our diversity. We can only do all of that if we truly, truly love God because we're doing it not for the sake of society, we're doing it for the sake of the relationship we, each of us, has with Jesus Christ and the relationship he has with the Father. It all works in very well. And that second reading is unbelievably uh, popular. The book of Revelation is, is like probably one of the most uh, popular and confusing books, but not really. It's a book written in a dream. And the author is sometimes called the seer, like a visionary, and it's usually attributed to John the Evangelist. We don't really historically know, but we'll go with that. It's part of scripture because it's been read 
and hand it on to us. That's how a book becomes scripture. It's read in the local community, it's preserved, and then it's passed on from Antioch to Jerusalem to Rome to Greece, etc. And that's how you and I have it today. And if a book was read way back when and not passed on, it's not scripture. If a book was read and nobody preserved it because it wasn't correct or wasn't authentic, you don't know what it is. And there are books like that. They're called Apocrypha. But this book, Revelation, talks about a dream world. A dream world in which, again, visionary sees it's bright, it's light, it's filled with power, and there are no lights on. There are no candles. Because the light is radiating from the center, which is Jesus. His poetic way of trying to describe heaven, eternity. Good, knock your socks off, seer. It doesn't matter, because what you're doing is trying to get that word from the first century to us, the 21st century. So there are many ways in which the scripture, again, goes back to remind us that Jesus is one with the Father. Jesus came to us, conquered death, the biggest problem of life, and is still available to us. And it's up to us to bring him into our own lives, personally and as a world, and we need him. You know him, we need him. It's up to us to bring him into the world and into our lives in a very personal way. And that starts with prayer. On your way to work, before you go to bed, before you eat, before you make love, prayer. Putting ourselves in the presence of God who loves us and wants us to love each other as he loves us. Beyond that, beyond that, there's not even imagination, not even the billions of stars. That's how powerful that is, that Jesus comes to us and says, I got a gift for you. I want you to love loving. I want you to love loving yourself and each other as God the Father loves me and I love him.